Uh, I'm curious about your thoughts on reduce themselves just so the panel is there. Tyler used to mean fell this year uh, reporting with WRA on these in North Carolina. Um, I'm, I'm curious about sort of the the sort of formula for accountability because it seems like one of the things that uh, can happen when a big story lands is that you know it's sort of missed. The public doesn't doesn't see it or it's overshadowed by some other big story. And, and I wonder, you know, are there things that we should be thinking about when we are working on investigative stories that, you know, make sure that they hit at the right moment to mm, the That's so important. Especially now, you know, I mean, now when everything changes, you know, five times a day the front page changes. Well, I would say a couple things. One is if it's, it's nice to have it before your legislature, you know, before they're going into session. But the other thing is that when you think about investigative projects, maybe think about it as twofold. So you got the big story, but just as important as the follow, the follow, the follow. You have to keep beating the drum because things don't always happen immediately, but if it's steady enough, you know, you, if it's steady enough, generally you'll have a legislator who finally takes up the cause and can introduce a bill that's going to make, you know, some of the changes. Obviously you can't, you know, write the bill for them, but we never do projects without thinking, you know, another year of, and, and, and in an innocence loss, we wrote stories for another year afterwards, um, looking at very specific cases and also still looking at what we saw as the gaps in the system itself. I think that's an important point that uh, persevere. You know, I think a lot of government agencies think will go away eventually. And if they can endure the one day story, they will, and then it's forgotten. So I think that's, you know, incredibly important. As, mm -hmm. you, and as you said, 600 stories, right? Yeah. Uh, I, I also did, I investigated a, a place called Bridgewater State Hospital. It's not a hospital, it's a state prison where uh, people who are, men who are mentally ill uh, within the correctional system are held. And several, peop several guys there uh, lost their lives. And uh, as a result of my stories, uh, there have been some very, very significant reforms. They've moved all the prison guards out of there. No more prison guards. But again, I think I wrote 30 stories. Uh, you know, I just kept coming back and back and back. And it was clear that I was going to keep coming back until something changed. Uh, and I think leads are really important. You really have to think hard about the most powerful lead you can come up with that is true to the story, but that will really suck people in because when you're dealing with data, that's not necessarily going to, to suck people in. And on the timing issue, in, in the Walter Reed case, we were always looking around, are there other reporters coming up here? You know, we were really defensive about that. And so we found out that yes, all of a sudden, while we were writing the story and it was almost ready to go, there, we found that there had been, I can't remember who it was right now, but another reporter from another outlet. And so they ran it on President's Day weekend, which means in Washington, these things really matter because people are out of town, <clears throat> they might not see it on a Sunday. And the, I remember the publisher was very upset about that. But we, you know, we had to say, well, because we were afraid someone was going to beat us to it. And luckily, there was enough media bounce in, in particular, Imus, because Imus, who was on the radio at that time, had a completely different audience, a lot of military folks and more conservative people, and that created a firestorm within the officer corps. And so that turned out to be critical in pushing the story. Well, I think yeah. you're being a little modest because I remember when that story came out and I was blown away by it. Well. You know, and, 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 you know and, and there's different kinds of projects out there, but you know, what Walter Reed was for me anyway is it was just devastatingly complete. And, and you, know, you read it and there was just no question that this is what happened. And it was told in a dignified, understated, but dramatic and, and emotional way. And there's just certain projects uh, and the time that you put, how long did you spend on that project? Well, we're, there were two of us and it was four months. Four, only four months? No, I'm embarrassed. I <laughs> no, no, I, I look back and say, how did that happen? It takes me four months to write a lead. <laughs> four months. Well, I, I can give you one more strategy because I also had the experience of an investigative piece running on President's Day weekend. Yeah. And uh, this was a story about uh, sort of the anatomy of a cover-up of someone getting killed by guards at Bridgewater State Hospital. So Tuesday rolled around, and, and the story's been out for two days, and I just started getting a little bit uh, antsy. The phone wasn't ringing the way I wanted it to. So what I did was I 
I looked up the governor's uh, schedule, and I found out that he was <laughs> <laughs> he was having a, a meeting with a with a with a, a, a body at the at the state house. And I know that there are often uh, the budget was under consideration. I figured that when he came out, there would be a few cameras outside waiting for him to ask him some questions. So I just got myself down there. And when he came out of the meeting, I said, Governor, what do you what do you think about a 23 year old man never convicted of a crime being killed by guards at Bridgewater State Hospital? <laughs> Because you can't rely on your competitors. They have all this reason not to draw attention to it, Exactly, right? exactly. <laughs> and in fact, in our case, the Army held a, a, secret, um, a secret press conference the weekend before. They knew it was coming out, and they called in a select number of reporters, including from the New York <clears throat> Times and Wall Street Journal, and they started briefing them on, on Walter Reed and how, all these improvements that they were making. And the reporters were like, why are you telling us this? What is the context? And they did enough questioning to figure out that this story was about to break. And most of them said, well, we're not going to be your mouthpiece. So, <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You know, I'll tell you one other thing about this, because I think there was a theme here and the, in terms of getting attention to your story. You know, the, the theme here, I think, is that we all did system stories, but we all told the stories with real people. And I think that's what get readers, you know, there's a lot of excitement over data reporting right now, and I'm excited about data reporting, and I, I love spreadsheets. But I really believe that if you can't tell the story with people, you're, you're, in, yeah. you're in trouble. Um, so you all have had a lot of experience, I'm sure, talking in, to other journalism groups, and in the process, seeing what other kind of innovations people are making to get around the economics of, of uh, investigative reporting. Can you talk a little bit about that, what you've seen maybe domestically, but also overseas where a lot of really fascinating things are happening? Um, well, in our case, um, <clears throat> I'm not at the Herald anymore, but before I left, I was still part of the, this. Uh, Carol and I were working together, and we're doing a, um, a juvenile justice project that's going to probably land um, probably in the summer. Um, but part of that is we... We're, we're working with USC Annenberg and we got a grant from them. And I mentioned that project because that is one of the ways that you can get things done is there are a ton of organizations that are helping journalists get these investigations done. They, they understand how important they are, but they also understand how expensive they are. You know, one of the things that happens when you do FOIAs is that even if right. you have them, you know, even if they deliver the paper, sometimes they make it cost prohibitive because they know that organizations, um, you know, that the budgets are very, you know, we don't have a lot of money to spend on these. So partnerships, um, you know, you've seen the ProPublica model and you know it works. I mean, you, you know, whereas we, you know, when you first, when I came, when I came up through the journalism, you were, you know, these independent bodies and everybody was competition. But there are now, there's now a space where we can do things together and I think and still have, you know, a good amount of impact. So when you talk about foundations, what are some of the ethical considerations that you need to have to well, the accept? Big, the big issue is independence, mm -hmm. making sure right. that the, even if you're using those funds that they don't, they, they cannot have any influence over the actual material that you're writing. And then transparency when you course, publish. And, yeah. in, in our case, you know, there's a little thing that runs under it that says, you know, this was, you know, made possible mm -hmm. by blah, blah, blah. Other innovative, you've been overseas. Can you talk a little bit about what you've seen? Yeah, I, I think there's a lot of promise in the, in the nonprofit model. I mean, the, the business model, the revenue model for what we do is it's destroyed. Uh, I mean, the, the, uh, the New York Times has a new revenue model. The Washington Post has a new revenue, revenue model. But I don't think their models are replicable for everyone else. And so I am getting more and more interested in uh, the nonprofit model uh, for everyone else. ProPublica, of course, has had a lot of success with this. And uh, the Center for Investigative Reporting uh, out in California has been doing this for a long time. I think uh, they're the oldest nonprofit uh, investigative news organization. And I was talking to uh, a guy, the guy who is the CEO there, Joaquin Alvarado, and uh, they have 75 reporters, and they're and they're financially stable to the point where Joaquin is now looking at other uh, projects, other uh, based on a nonprofit model for with, with investigative reporting overseas and in other parts of the United States. I think there's, uh, I've heard a lot of talk about establishing uh, nonprofit uh, organizations in uh, some of the major media markets to, to fund investigative reporting for existing uh, legacy newspapers. And I think that has some uh, potential as well. 
Um, you know, I think investigative reporting really is in crisis, especially at smaller newspapers uh, all over the country. It's disappearing. Uh, we at The Globe believe investigative reporting is good for business. We think it's, uh, we know, because we have these incredible metrics now, we know how many people are on bostonglobe.com at any one time. We, knew, we know which stories are getting the most readers. We know the average amount of time uh, somebody is spending on a story. And we find that people love accountability journalism, and they read it, and they subscribe because of it. So I think it would be uh, nice if publishers and editors around the country realize that uh, if you can make the investment, this is actually good business. I, I really believe that. It's not just altruism, and it's not just saving democracy, which it is. But I also believe you can make money doing this. Uh, and like I say, aside from that, I think uh, I'm seeing a lot of uh, success, not enough, but, but significant success with the nonprofit model. Uh, I was in London recently, and there's a, a new, uh, newish uh, nonprofit investigative news organization, the Bureau for Investigative Reporting. And uh, they've done terrific work. So, and I just want to talk about, uh, I've been overseas a lot recently, and there are, in almost every country, there's, there are consortiums popping up of people who are willing to work together who weren't willing to work together before. Some of it, uh, you know, depending on the country, is actually underwritten by foundations or, or in some cases, the government even. There are a, a, two that are, um, in particular, I wanted to mention, who love to partner also. So, you know, love to partner with Americans. One is the um, uh, o, 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 OCCRP, the uh, Overseas Corruption and Accountability Reporting Project does excellent work, and mainly on a lot of our allies. So, you know, that's that's one thing you might want to look up. And then the other one is, of course, the International Journalists Consortium. Yes, I'm yeah. getting that wrong. But they did the Panama Papers, which was right. just in itself an amazing cross-border yeah. thing. And then as far as community uh, journalism goes, there's a a new um, nonprofit foundation in Rappahannock Co County, which is in Virginia, and it's helping to fund the local Rappahannock Times to do investigative reporting. So, you know, wealthy families who are, or not even wealthy families, they're, I mean, they're, they're taking contributions. They've stood up a, an arm, you know, it's, a, it's an independent arm of the newspaper. It's a foundation. And they'll team up uh, freelancers with, you know, maybe one person who they can break away from the actual newspaper. And their idea is to also make that a, a regional approach, uh, if they can, you know, show that it works, bring the community in, and so far it's had a lot of really good success from. Or they've um, they've really, I think, improved their standing with readers because some of these issues that take time they were not able to address before. Yes. Uh, so, are we supposed to identify ourselves? Yes. <laughs> Who are you? Michelle Boyston from the Washington Post. So the stories you talked about had to do with kind of public agencies. Did any of you in your careers kind of find yourself shifting to being interested in some other area of investigative reporting, like you know, like um, you know, big social media platforms? I did an investigation on dying elephants in America's zoos one time. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh, variety. <laughs> I don't know if just over your long career if you kind of found yourself attracted still to the accountability of, of the public systems or if you started being interested. Or institutions in like, yeah. you know, non-government institutions like the church, right? Right, exactly. When I got on the Globe Spotlight team, we specifically wanted to do something other than uh, investigate government agencies. We thought the previous Spotlight team had sort of gotten, gotten into a rut that way. So our first project was an investigation of Toll Brothers uh, Construction Company, which builds uh, McMansions. And it was an investigation into their shoddy uh, construction uh, practices. Uh, for instance, we discovered that you could break into a Toll Brothers home with a box cutter, by just uh, uh, <laughs> which we put on video. So, <laughs> so uh, we went from uh, Toll Brothers Construction Company uh, to the Archdiocese of Boston. And, and, and they were non-government non uh, agencies that we were looking into. So, but I get your point, and I agree. I think, in a way, it's, it's easier to investigate a government agency because you have a right to records. Right. When you're looking at a public, when you're looking at a private corporation uh, or, the, or a religious institution, mm -hmm. uh, you, don't, you don't have the same right to public records, so it's more difficult, more challenging. 
you know, and that brings us to the Trump administration, you know, whose relationships, whose business ties, whose, you know, social <clears throat> ties are still so hidden from us. Yeah. And I think this is, you know, one of the big challenges for investigative reporting. So there was another hand back there. Well, thank you so much. Yes. Congratulations, Michael. I just want to get that question across to you. The equivalent of, uh, of uh, going viral in the internet, um, and going back to your situation in Illinois, where you have gone to another state, found the you know, nuggets that you mentioned, and went back to check the information in Illinois and discover all of the problems leading to people dying mm -hmm. in, in, in these homes. And, were there any viral consequences to that beyond Illinois? Uh, all the states looking at what had happened in Illinois and then changing the mm. laws or the process? Have Illinois other states started? looked, you know? Yeah. Uh, I, I'm not aware that states reacted. I think other journalists have reacted, and that's what's really gratifying. Is and I and, and when I was in Seattle and and came did the first story on Money Falls the person I found this federal program. I called up other journalists and said, you know, there's this probably a unique story sitting in your state. Yep. And I think after that first story, which is where I met Claire first, uh, is I think there were six derivative projects around the country. Uh, based on that that germ. Now, what Trish and I have done, you know, we haven't seen a manifestation of that just yet. But I have been contacted by other reporters, you know, some <coughs> healthcare freelance reporters, some newspapers, you know, inquiring about what was the methodology. And so, you know, I think that's what's really cool about this panel and about what we all do. You're not alone out there. You know, just call, call us. Uh, I'll give over documents. We'll give over techniques. Call Trish. People call her at least once a week from around the country asking for help. I think. Uh, she has an amazing network of people that she she's mentored, uh, and we all try to help each other. And that's that's really what's what's neat is we're in a collaborative. We're not competitors in many ways. And there's many organizations besides Neiman out there that can help, whether it's SPJ or investigative reporters and editors. You know, join these groups, and and you'll you'll find this network of people who will who'll be willing to help you, maybe teach you, guide you, give you a contact. Uh, I get valuable information yeah. from journalists all the time. You don't have to reinvent the wheel right. every time you want to do something. You can build from it. Yeah, the same thing happened to us. We had uh, we had so many reporters saying, what about the hospital in our community? Or what about the VA in our community? And luckily, we had a lot of reporters calling saying, how did you get into the VA? How did you you know, get into Walter Reed? Who did you call? And and yeah, exactly. Very collaborative because we wanted to you know, if we could have done it ourselves, we would have, but there's no way. And so it was, I mean, the greatest thing was to hear that the Army had sent out, they saw this, they saw this coming. There were calls all over the country from reporters, so they sent out a rapid reaction force <laughs> to <laughs> go to every Army hospital and every VA and, like, make sure that there wasn't a big scandal brewing, which, of course, you know, you couldn't deter they couldn't determine that so there were a lot of uh, individual stories that popped up after that and it was great uh great to see yes hi i'm chris Sanford. i'm a tv correspondent with german public television uh, you talked about partnering i was wondering if you break a story do you partner with say tv to to give the story <coughs> bigger impact or is that too risky uh, because they might take offense. I know at the Chicago Tribune they've partnered with TV and other outlets as well. Radio also. And it wasn't detrimental, it was to the benefit of both parties. We did a spotlight experiment where we partnered with a, with a local TV station and I thought it was terrific. Uh, they, there would be a, a broadcast on the 11 o'clock news and then we'd have the story on, uh, in the Globe the next day. I thought it worked really well. And we had TV exposure, but I wouldn't call it a partnership because I didn't trust I do I didn't trust them to um, you know do what we wanted to do with the information. But so what we did was, um, you know, I, I had been working with NBC at the time, so we set it up so that actually NBC broke the story on nightly news, but it it was it was at the moment that it went up on our website, and they said breaking now on the Washington Post website. Mm -hmm. So we got, you know, more eyeballs from that. Uh, and, but a funny story on that is I couldn't get NBC's attention at first because they were worried. Well, let me say that they wouldn't touch the story at first because visuals are so important to TV that they, they are more sensitive to creating problems for themselves with the institution, thinking that all they need to do is cut them off from the visuals and they're sunk, you know, where we have workarounds. 
So I had to like go through a back channel <laughs> and communicate finally with Brian Williams and say, look, you got to get someone to listen to this. And so he did right away. <laughs> but it was, so that I would th think, you know, TV has got some other considerations. Yes. Um, hi, I just I wanted to ask you all about if has there been a silver, I mean, we all know there has been a silver lining to the Trump election <coughs> in terms of interest, um, public interest in the media and, you know, renewed more subscriptions and, and the owner of the Washington Post hiring so many more people mm -hmm. and also the Times expanding. But I wanted to know in each of your experiences at your papers, how have you seen it um, a change since November? Who wants to start? Well, well I think there's definitely uh, increased appreciation among our readers of the importance of journalism, the importance of investigative reporting, the importance of uh, accountability journalism. So uh, all that's a plus. Uh, subscriptions are up at the Globe but, as well as the New York Times and the Washington Post. So, so all that's uh, a, a great plus. I think people appreciate what we do more than ever before. Uh, but I think, you know, we're in a kind of a uh, troubling era. Uh, without any doubt about it. I mean, to have the President of the United States call you an enemy of the American people is, is serious. I think uh, um, he's, he's emboldened uh, people who persecute journalists uh, overseas. Uh, I, I think it's, I think it's uh, serious. Um, Has the Globe increased its, its Washington Focus coverage? Or? Yeah, we have. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and we have closed all our foreign bureaus and all our uh, bureaus across the United States except for Washington. Mm. And uh, we are definitely going to keep yeah. it open and probably expand it. Uh, Andre? Well, we're pretty new to the Times, but one of the things that they did was they, after the election, they um, doubled their commitment to covering national yeah. news. So the na I'm part of the national staff that's been expanded you know, so that there are people literally all over all over the country, mm. um, and part of that is to collect voices mm -hmm. um, and to get as many perspectives as possible, um, and be you know to be part of our you know how we cover the country. Yep. At Tribune, I think we've seen a continued expansion of our commentary sections, and we're finding that readers really like the commentaries and, and, and they like to hear the voices. In other words, I mean, the Times just made a lot of news with one of their new hires, you know, conservative voice. And, and I think that's really smart in a way because it, it shows people you're willing to listen to all sides, right? And so I'll take a slightly different tack, but what I'm seeing personally uh, since Trump's been elected is that citizens know now that they have to be more empowered. And, and I can't prove this yet, but I'm getting a ton more tips from average citizens hmm. who want action now. They realize hmm. that they have to pick up the torch too. You know, and, and that so more and more people are contacting reporters and asking for help. And a lot of times it's a, you know, a, it's a zoning issue or it's a tax issue or you know, it's not something that rises to the level of investigative project. But people more and more are realizing they have to make their voices heard. And I'm starting to see that more now. Well, at the Post, you know, we've, it's, it reinvigorated all elements of things that are focused on the government. So we have more, more reporters. The investigative staff is about to double in size. We, a couple of years ago, we were down to like three of us, and, uh, and now they're hiring eight new reporters that are going to be called the Rapid Investigative Group. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's, kind response, of a, yeah, it it's kind yeah. of an oxymoron, but you know, it's, it's, good, it's a good aim, so we'll see how that goes. The other thing that's really exciting is, if you, um, if you haven't read it, is David Farenthal's um, series that relied on crowdsourcing and people participating in his hunt for uh, Donald Trump's charitable giving or not. And so uh, people seem to really like that. And I think thinking about what you could do with that model, you know, how could you get people using social media out there to help you is, is really kind of exciting too. And then my favorite theme is transparency for us. I, I think one of the reasons we lost the public is that we are not very transparent in what we do and how we do it and what kind of judgments we make and what is the difference between editorial and news pages. And let's not just tell them, let's actually show them. Why should they trust us? Especially when there's so much blurring. You know, there's so much blurring on what is journalism really, and what is opinion really? And I also think that we have a lot to account for in that in that regard because I see things in our paper, just you know, an adjective here or there, or a certain kind of phrase that we would never have been able to get away with before. So I think we really need to be careful and go back to the very basics of 
understated, you know, unbiased reporting, and maybe even start labeling things. Well, if I can uh, paraphrase uh, an inspiration to a lot of people on this panel, Trish and I were at an event last night where Marty Baron mm -hmm. was speaking. Mm -hmm. and, and if anything, it'll make you inspired about journalism. It'll be listening to, to Marty for a little bit. But he talked about uh, how it's incumbent upon all of us in this room and in this profession uh, to do what we uniquely do best and to provide the kind of stories and material that only we can provide. That's what's going to distinguish us from the adjectives and the, yeah. the buzz and you know all the the, the web viral stuff. Uh, you know it, it's quality product. It's back to the basics. Uh, one of the best compliments Trish and I got on our most current project was uh, someone from investigative reporters and editors said they were looking it over. So you know this was just old fashioned journalism. Right. You know, and it's like wow, that's that's a real compliment. <laughs> you know, because they were saying they were arguing among the judges. And it's like there was nothing flashy here. There was no crowdsourcing. There was no Twitter magic. You know, it was just old-fashioned reporting and yeah that's what made it great and that's that's what I, you know I think is the inspiration that we should all take is is old-fashioned reporting good storytelling good people and finding spreadsheets, stories and spreadsheets, and a spreadsheet <laughs> certainly behind the scenes <laughs> and facts. Doesn't love spreadsheets <laughs> yes. yes well in fact and facts I mean we're in a world we're swimming facts. we're yes. swimming in opinion mm -hmm. and I think we need reporting that emphasizes the facts and we need to have Readers and viewers and listeners believe that when they come to us, they're going to get the facts. They're going to get they're going to get the truth. It's not just going to be someone's opinion. It's not going to be spin. These are going to be the hard, cold facts, and we can all agree on what they are. So we have uh, time for a couple more. Yes. Hi, Paul, Carol. I'm a freelance journalist here in Boston. Curious to ask the panel: um, Do you think the type of media uh, matters? It seems to me that most of the groundbreaking investigative reporting comes from print media. And I don't mean that as a slight to yeah. those folks in broadcast media, but it, it seems like um, you have more freedom and more flexibility than perhaps you would. I, I can't really think of any mm -hmm. broadcast, uh, maybe the, was it the Food Lion case? Mm -hmm. that maybe some did back in the day. Um, but I'm curious <clears throat> what the panel's thoughts are on whether print is premier over broadcast. Mm -hmm. And how you see that changing as we get into multimedia uh, reporting and, and try to be that. unbiased now. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I'm, I was just going to say I have a good friend who works for the Marshall Project, Ken Armstrong, and he's done collaborations with NPR, <laughs> with television, and print newspapers. And and I think the different mediums, when they come together, can have that impact. We were talking about collaboration, and and if you call Ken Armstrong up at the Marshall Project if you want to learn more, because I'm sure he'll be happy to talk about his many, many collaborations and how successful they've been on every kind of medium. And they've been challenging, whether it's TV, radio. He said NPR was incredibly challenging. How do you translate a newspaper project to radio? You know, and they took a whole different tact on the radio. They took a different lead. They took, and, and they worked together to, to find that middle ground because you have a different audience, right? We're writing for an, an audience. You know, Chicago Tribune audience is different than a Washington Post audience or a Boston Globe or a New York Times. So, you know, you write for your readers. And, and so when it comes to impact, uh, I think newspapers have the advantage because we have the permanency, right? You can, you can carry us on the train. You can take us home. You can read it a week later or a year later. It's easier to, to maybe download on the web, you know, and you can scan it quicker than I can listen to an audio, you know, perhaps. That might be one disadvantage that's inherent in the mediums. But isn't radio making a comeback? Haven't I read that, that radio is more popular than ever right now with, with readers and viewers and listeners? Am I, am I right? Yeah, you know, at the Center for Investigative Reporting uh, out in uh, Center for the Bay Area, I mean, they, they have started a radio program. It's called Reveal. And so they, all their investigations become a one-hour radio program. And uh, I also think that there's, I agree, there's a lot of uh, potential and a lot of power in uh, co media co collaboration. And Reveal relies a lot on print reporters to bring them things that they can collaborate on. Exactly. I've worked with uh, Frontline and 60 Minutes. Um, and yeah, it, it's a completely different way of thinking, but the facts still need to be there. And we're usually the ones that come up with that because we have more time and more resources. And then you have to hunt for visuals, which is that's the different way of thinking about things. But what television has that we don't have that <clears throat> is such a huge audience. You know, if you're if you put something on 60 Minutes, it's it it's it goes viral on its own, really. And Congress, you know, hears about it and that sort of thing. Same same with Frontline, but they do a lot of historical things too. So, 
Yes. Fake news seems to fake be news. so much in the air. <laughs> what are you all doing to counteract it? It must be a full-time job. Yes, to... definitely. Well, we have a, a new uh, motto at the Globe, which we're promoting, and it's facts matter. And so that's our, that's our institutional answer to fake news. But I, I agree with you. I think the whole concept of fake news is, is uh, really, really troubling. And, uh, you know, the idea that people can have their own facts uh, is, is, is very, very troubling because, you know, facts should be facts. And we should all, we can have different opinions, but we all should be able to agree on what the facts are. So the whole concept of fake news is, is um, it, it makes it difficult for people to talk to one another. Are you running into that? Um, a number of news organizations have also invested in a person who is dedicated to vetting information. You know, when you hear a um, a speech given by our president, you know, there's PolitiFact, and there's a number of internal people who are dedicated to literally just vetting those those that information so that the readers or the viewers know exactly what they're getting and if it's true or not. And that, that had not been the case before this particular election in the same numbers that it is now. Mike? We're not doing anything specific that I'm aware of. The counter fake news in the sense of how do you counter that? I think the way you counter that is to do the best job you can every day and try to be accountable to it. And we're looking at it, first of all, to figure out what, what exactly, how does it exactly work? And, What's fake about it? Because you know a lot of it is mixed in with actual news that has a slant to it. So I don't think we yet um, know enough about you know where it where it really reaches people, how it actually works, and um, and Europe is a great model for that. They are they've been dealing with fake news that has been propagated by you know with the hand of the Russians for a long time, uh, sort of swept east to west and and um, have come up with ways to label it. Like there's a great organization called Stop Fake, which I think is in Ukraine, and there's one in, in, Czech, in Czech Republic and Germany. And so they're springing up all over. And some of them are, again, collaborations between journalists in different countries or different parts of a country uh, to, fer to ferret out the ownership of these, especially the Russian ownership, which is always hidden. Uh, so again, I think there's some innovation there, but I also think, you know, in terms of the the with the uh, post that we have, um, we have some more explaining to do to really understand what it is, and the who's scary behind thing. it, and who's behind it. We do that. I mean, we do that. We, we do, but it doesn't seem to really. Well, Marty Barron resonate. last night was talking about this, this more scary derivative, our bigger issue than fake news almost is um, the, the number of Americans who want to believe it. Yeah. And, and that's, he was citing some polling, you know, was it Trish, 80 some percent of Republicans believe that we yeah. are lying when we, whatever we report, yeah. you know, so it, it's, our problem isn't fake news, it's just that people aren't believing us, you know, and there's, there's a whole segment. So that's where we have our job cut out, I think, is trying to, to re-engage our readers and convince them that we are neutral and that comes perhaps from from decades of being elite in a sense of we never felt we had to explain ourselves i don't have to tell you how i do my projects you know i think more and more we all have with our projects how we did it you know here's our records go go follow in my footsteps and see how we did it we're doing that more and more we're putting the records online that started yeah. years ago and I think it's escalated as we realize we do have to educate the public. And I think that's our big battle, not some guy in a basement in his underwear doing fake news. It's, it's the minds of the American people that we have to capture. There's not a modern project now. I'll say this very quickly. There is not a modern journalism project now that does not embed their projects now with the documents. Yeah. yeah. It's just, it's, it's, it, now it's protocol. It's just what also, we do. You know, if you think about, getting back to your question, what do people really know about what a reporter does? And how we gather facts, how we analyze things, how we think about them, how we talk to people, they don't have an idea. So that's what I'm talking about when I'm advocating transparency is to somehow open that up so people can understand what it is we do and how we do it. Newsrooms are petrified of doing that. But. So I, um, I wanted to close by asking you all um, one last question, and it is about lies, but it's about, it's looking at it from the other side. One of the things that I've been thinking a lot about um, is uh, 
the extent to which journalists are lied to, um, particularly <laughs> investigative journalists. And I think that that has a material impact on how we are shaped um, professionally and as human beings too, right? It's a weird thing to go through one's work always on the, you know, with your radar, always up for that because it happens. And, and I'm wondering if, um, if you all can recall um, the first or one of the first times that that happened to you and what, it, wh what formative impact it had on you professionally. For me, it was on the police beat when in my beginning years, and it's actually what drove me to investigative reporting. I was a police beat reporter, and the police lied to me repeatedly. And I wrote stories that I'm greatly embarrassed by today because mm. I believed what the police were telling me, you know, and it was sort of my job, and they're giving it to me. I have to write stories every day. And, and you know, so they, they, one, one was uh, uh, that turned into a big story, a, a raid involving um, a, a woman whose, whose daughter had been raped, and the police acted like they had caught the rapist. When it turned out, the backstory was the family had caught the rapist. But they lied to me, you know. And so it was this repeated lying on the police beat where I got tired of being told what the news was each day, and I decided I want to make the news myself. Yeah, you know, I want to figure out what it is. And that was really a driver as, from the police beat. I think mine was this project, uh, was the project, and, uh, and knowing that I had the documents that said one thing, but what was coming from the... Um, from the state agency was something completely different. Um, and, you know, the thing is, what's so important is that there's a way to do this that's still very civilized, but you have to be so very clear that and say, what I have does not match what you're saying. And that gives them, you know, sometimes it gives them the opportunity to rethink what they say, and sometimes <laughs> they were misspoken. <laughs> well, for me, it's probably not the first time that I was lied to. I think. Uh, Public officials lie to us uh, all the time, really. But certainly the most striking was to hear uh, the man who was uh, the moral uh, representative of uh, Boston and you know, the most powerful man, arguably, in the state of Massachusetts was Cardinal Law. And uh, he repeatedly lied about uh, his knowledge of clergy sexual abuse. Uh, I remember after our first story came out, he held a, a press conference. He previously refused to talk to us. And he uh, apologized for instances of clergy sex abuse. And he was asked, are there any abusers serving right now? And he, sa he said, no. And uh, there were some other questions. And he got asked the question again. And he said, no. And uh, later in the news conference, he was asked a third time. He got angry. And he said, get this straight. You know, there are no abusers serving in the archdiocese today. And there were, there were I, I can't remember how many, but more than 20, and they were, they were all eventually uh, shelled. But it was extraordinary to see this man who was, uh, as I said, the, the, the moral authority for our community get up and lie over and over and over again. And Mike, how does that, how does that shape you as a, as a journalist? Well, I like to say that I'm uh, not, uh, not uh, cynical, but I am skeptical uh, <laughs> pretty much uh, all the time. I think our, our, maybe our primary function uh, as reporters is to question authority. It's an old, uh, you know, 60s saying, but I think uh, that's what we do. We question authority no matter who it is, no matter how, no matter how trustworthy they may seem, no matter how powerful they are. That, that's our job. Even our mother, right? <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that the old, the old axiom? Well, her, you Your mother you says she loves them. you, check it out. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, because I deal with government institutions mainly, I think I, um, I think the, I think it was at the Pentagon that it really came through, the, the most strikingly. And what it, and what it was is, is the whole huge public affairs apparatus. They are there, not, not uniquely, but they're there to spin you. And if that includes lying to you, so be it. And that really <clears throat> taught me that there are. There's, you know, you have to wean yourself away from public affairs. And there are so many good people in government who want to do the right thing, who don't like lying, who don't, you know, who think that sunshine is the best, uh, you know, recipe for, for doing good government and are willing to take risks or at least willing to tell you the truth if you can protect them and, and find them, which means you have to, you have to walk the halls and you have to, um, you know, sit down in their offices and take them out to lunch and all that sort of thing. And that's the whole fun is getting around this huge expensive apparatus. Like, I love that, even in little ways, you know, when they've, 
they get all together, they figure out what the spin line is, and then you can just go, you know, around it. And in, even in little ways, I just find that really fun to say, well, you guys, you know, you think you're... <laughs> so that would be mine. Um, I, uh, I have really enjoyed this afternoon tremendously. Um, I, I want to... So one thing I want to say is uh, thank Mike Barron's for reminding me of um, Bill... Bill Gaines, uh, with whom I did work a lot in Chicago, and I'm gonna I'm gonna do my imitation. So it's glasses <laughs> down here, and the way I recall it is, Anne Marie, it's all one big story. <laughs> <laughs> that was the gesture. <laughs> and um, uh, and and I I, I really just uh, if if you're a journalist or if you're not, if you're someone who depends on journalism. Um, to keep a democracy safe, uh, I'm, I'm guessing you are all as inspired today um, as I was. So I do want to um, thank very much uh, Dana and Mike and Audra and Mike for this really incredible conversation um, to uh, congratulate again um, my former colleagues, uh, Trish and, and Mike, for uh, their winning the 50th anniversary uh, Bingham Prize, and of course, thanking uh, Clara and Joan for making uh, the Bingham Prize uh, possible. So please uh, join me in um, applauding this journalism one more time.